Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And today, I'm going to step way outside of my normal comfort zone, which I've come to think of as my slow death zone, and I'm going to do something completely different. So if you uh, have joined us in the salon today, expecting to hear another great lecture by one of the psychedelic luminaries that we've been so fortunate to listen to these past two and a half years, well, you may be a little disappointed because today you're going to hear mainly from me. But uh, with the addition of music from several of our fellow saloners and uh, one short soundbite from the Bard McKenna. But never fear, next week uh, we'll be back in our normal groove and I'll be playing yet another lecture, interview, or conversation that I hope you'll also find to be worth your time. However, today uh, I have a few observations I want to make uh, that have come to me during the past several weeks while I've been on a spiritual quest of sorts. Essentially, uh, today's podcast is a series of short notes to myself, little things that I don't want to forget. First of all, I need to get a few housekeeping details out of the way by mentioning that uh, all of my remarks here are offered under the Creative Commons Non-Commercial Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license, which basically means that uh, you're free to use them in your own non-commercial work without worry about copyright infringement. And you'll find the details of that license at the creativecommons.org website. However, I will also be playing some music in today's program, and that music is fully copyrighted by the respective musicians who own the music. In other words, if you want to use their music, uh, you first must obtain their permission. And on the program notes for this podcast, I'll post their contact information. Those program notes, by the way, can be found at psychedelicsalon.org. Also, I want to apologize in advance to the musicians and to you for the sound quality of this program. While many of our listeners in the States enjoy a broadband connection to the net, the great majority of our overseas listeners are still working with dial-up connections, and uh, so I do my best to keep these file sizes to a minimum. What this means, of course, is that you aren't hearing today's music at its best. So I'll post links to what online versions of these songs are currently available, and I'll do that in the program notes for the uh, podcast, and you can go to their sites and hear their music in much better fidelity. But I'm very pleased to tell you that the musicians whose music I'll be playing today are all fellow saloners. So uh, I hope you think about today's podcast as a group effort on the part of a few of us fellow saloners who stitch today's program together for you. My guess is that you already know the principal artist behind the first three songs you'll hear. Although they are copyrighted by Liquid Alchemy, that is uh, actually a music project that my dear friend Queer Ninja is involved in. The first song, Miss About You, also features the lovely vocal stylings of Sharon. And the second and third songs I'll be playing are Counting Days and Long Distance, both of which feature the ninja himself. The next song in today's podcast is by our new MySpace friend, The Sun Blindness, with the uh, lovely piece Velvet Apple. And the closing song is Anything Can Happen, by my friends Jacques Cordell and Wells, sometimes also known as Chateau Hayuk, and whose song El Alien is our theme song here in the salon. So thank you wonderful, beautiful musicians, one and all. It's uh, such an honor to also have you as fellow saloners, and it's really nice to know you're here. Oh, and before I forget to say this, if you want to comment on any of the things I have to say in this podcast, please do it either in the comments section of the program notes for the podcast or uh, on the Psychedelic Salon forum, which you can find on thegrowreport.com or on our myspace.com slash psychedelic salon page. But uh, please don't send them to me in an email because I no longer have the time to read and respond to it all. And uh, if you're one of my longtime friends or relatives, uh, <laughs> well, I'm sorry I haven't answered your email either. Uh, sorry, guys. You see, uh, in order to concentrate my time on these podcasts from the salon and on my new podcast channel, MatrixCast.com, I'm now trying to limit myself to uh, no more than an hour and a half on the Internet each day. 
other than the time it takes for uh, doing these podcasts and posting uh, program notes, etc. And what that means is that uh, virtually all of my net time now is going to be focused on those three online forums and uh, practically no time is going to be spent on email, at least uh, for the time being. Now, where to begin? I guess the best place to start is to say that not long ago I left the jurisdiction of these no longer United States of America and I journeyed into some uncharted territory. And now that I've returned, I, I want to record a few recollections of my journey so that I can remember not only where I've been, but more importantly, where I'm heading. Because as my Mexican friends sometimes say, if you don't change your direction, you're going to wind up where you're heading. Now uh, for a couple of reference points. Should you want to follow up on some of the ideas I'll be talking about today, there are uh, two places you can go to begin entering into the mind space I was in when I uh, began this latest quest. One is the uh, excellent little movie, uh, My Dinner with Andre. Uh, although I first saw that film many years ago, it, uh, it wasn't until a few weeks ago when I saw it again that its uh, message finally sunk in. The other point of reference is the marvelous book by Paulo Coelho titled The Zahir, that's Z-A-H-I-R. I don't intend to discuss that book in any detail right now other than to mention one thing, and that is uh, Coelho's discussion of the concept of detaching from your personal history, which is uh, one of the things I did on my recent journey. The reason I mention this is that uh, Coelho gives proper credit to Carlos Castaneda for giving him the inspiration for this concept, but uh, it's Castaneda himself that I feel obliged to mention right now. I know that uh, many of our fellow Saloners are quite taken with Castaneda's work, as I was for many years and uh, in a way still am. I've not only read all of his books, I also read several books of commentary about his work. And there are many insights to be gained from reading Castaneda, but uh, I think it's very important for you to know that uh, these are works of fiction. Don Juan is not a historical figure, but rather a composite of several people. And I know this with absolute certainty from my acquaintance with uh, two people who know about these things from the inside and who have had personal dealings with some of the Castaneda cult members. And make no mistake about it, uh, poor Carlos eventually uh, began believing his own fiction and spun himself and his followers into what I believe to be a very dark place. Now that part is uh, only my personal opinion, of course, but uh, the part about his books being fiction is a fact that you can uh, take to the bank. So be very careful that you don't get too carried away, as I once did, uh, with the wonderful stories he tells. Now, getting back to the business of detaching from one's own personal history. That is a process that I have now completed in uh, regards to the personal history of the first 60 years of my life when I was known to my friends and family as Larry. From where I now sit, Larry is dead and gone. But I have to admit that uh, after completing a multi-day ceremony to lay Larry to rest, I had to go through a grieving process which, uh, to tell the truth, took me completely by surprise. And so, now here are a few of the thoughts that came to mind as I was laying Larry to rest. Perhaps a fragment or two will resonate with you. I certainly hope so. I'm not going to present these ideas in any coherent form of a story or essay. Each one uh, more or less stands on its own, just like the random thoughts that flow through our consciousnesses uh, all day, every day. You see, lately I've, uh, I've been brooding about the fact that I lost that special sense of being alive that I experienced 12 years ago once I began to believe that I would actually survive my struggle with prostate cancer. I didn't want to take life for granted again, and yet I was. I had the feeling that I should be embracing life, living large, and yet, uh, <laughs> well, I spent my weekend sitting here... Uh, listening to some of my favorite music and enjoying the gentle breeze that drifted through the windows instead of going out and embracing life uh, in the way that others expected me to. Instead, I just sat here and enjoyed the warm peace and being alive. Ah, the freedom to sit and do nothing. But I constantly thought, if only I could turn off that damn voice telling me to get up and do something. Why did it depress me, I wonder, when... I just relaxed and didn't accomplish something over the weekend. 
my problem, I discovered, was that there had been far too much doing in my life and not nearly enough being. I felt as if I was forever balanced on the cusp of chaos. But now, finally, and as sad as it may sometimes seem to me to be, all of those old Larry thoughts are gone. Gone forever. Respect, I now realize that I spent the best years of my life uh, working incredibly long hours just to be able to afford to buy more stuff and to hold on to the stuff I'd already acquired. I didn't own my stuff, it owned me. But the recent firestorm we went through here in Southern California taught me a valuable lesson. One of the things that I thought might be lost forever was a collection of several dozen family photo albums that uh, my mother labored to create during the last decade or so of her life. And after the fires, I decided that I would scan all of them and save them online somewhere. But then it dawned on me that uh, the project of scanning all those huge books would uh, take me weeks, possibly months. And the time spent doing that would no longer be available for me to do more important things, like producing podcasts. And so, uh, I'm instead packing them all in the best airtight containers I can afford and uh, storing them for my descendants to find one day, uh, should they ever be interested in their distant family history. And as for all of my own photos from my college years, well, I'm throwing them all out because no one but me now knows uh, what they're all about or who's in them. I no longer have time to spend looking back. So, whoosh! A large chunk of my personal history has now been discarded forever, and my load is already much lighter. I now finally understand that uh, nothing I possess is more precious to me than the opportunity to be able to appreciate a cool breeze on a warm summer's day. At long last, I understand that 
Everything I do consumes some of my precious time in this dimension. And so I want to be sure that uh, I am doing something of value for my spirit with uh, what time I still have left. Something important, like cooking breakfast for a friend. It feels so long and far away from here Since I saw you without dreaming And all this time has served to separate The waiting from my heart My ship has sailed so long ago And the oceans come behind me I still feel the gentle breeze Kissing me goodbye Well, let me Live the way that I can see Oh, is righteous and is sacred But help me leave this sticky web behind That holds me in the past And time plays tricks on memories And makes everything seem perfect Parting words are so muffled now But I still feel the truth Years ago, I stumbled across an old Irish poem that, uh, sadly, sums up the life I lived as Larry. It is simply called O'Driscoll. And to, to get you in the mood to hear this poem from the point of view I'm coming from right now, I really should play track three from Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, the song called Time, particularly the line that talks about digging around on a piece of ground in your hometown but then goes on to remind me that, yeah, maybe I do still have something more to say. Uh, however, during the time I was stuck in the belly of one of the great corporate beasts, uh, this poem pretty much sums up what I was feeling. O'Driscoll drove with a song, the wild duck and the drake, from the tall and tufted reeds of a drear heart lake. And he saw how the reeds grew dark with the coming of night tide. And he dreamt of the long, dim hair of Bridget, his bride. Then he heard it, high up in the air, a piper piping away. And never was piping so sad, and never was piping so gay. Then he saw young men and young girls dance in a level place, 
with Bridget his bride among them, with a sad and a gay face. The dancers gathered around him, and many a sweet thing said. An old man brought him red wine, and a young girl white bread. But Bridget drew him by the sleeve, and away from the merry band, to old men playing with cards, with a twinkling of ancient hands. And he sat, and he played in a dream, and he talked not of evil chance, till one bore Bridget his bride away from the merry dance. He bore her away in his arms, a handsomest young man there, and his lips and his neck and his arms were drowned in her long dim hair. O'Driscoll scattered the cards, and out of his dream awoke, and old men, and young men, and young girls were gone like a drifting smoke. Then he heard it, high up in the air, a piper piping away, and never was piping so sad, and never was piping so gay. I might add, and Larry has now gone away. You know, once you lose heart, you have lost your life. I know that I lost heart when I came to believe that freedom is an illusion. But I now know that it's an illusion without which I cannot live. And so I've decided that I must make the best of what I've got, because uh, that alone is the difference between a well-spent life and a wasted life, at least for me. Like many people I know, uh, I spent most of my life trying to get rich because uh, 
I thought that then I could do more good for people than I could as a poor person. I wanted to get rich and use the money to save the world. But uh, that dream never materialized, and so I gave up. But when I stopped trying to save the world, I also stopped trying to save myself. And uh, that was a big mistake. However, uh, somehow, uh, in spite of myself, I, I never lost my dream of at least making my own little corner of the world a slightly better place than it was when I first arrived here. For a while, I became involved in politics and various other causes, but uh, eventually I came to feel as if I was merely rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And so I've abandoned all of those activities, uh, for I found that a true political revolution must first be preceded by a cultural revolution. And cultural revolutions, my friends, take place one mind at a time. And that revelation finally led me to get serious about my investigation of psychedelic medicines. Ultimately, I, I quit using psychedelics recreationally in order to use them in a more spiritual way and experience their true power. And it was shortly after I made that decision that I heard Terence McKenna for the first time. People don't take enough. That's all. Uh, you know, I mean, people are confused about what's going on. First of all, uh, taking psychedelics has a certain measure of, of chicness about it. Well, everybody wants to be chic, but, and you can get into the club merely by saying you took it, but you don't want to lie like a dog, so the way to get into the club without paying your dues is to take some piss and amount, and then run around raving about that. Uh, so when we talk about the psychedelic experience, it's not clear we're all talking about the same thing. It's sort of like talking about France, and you have the people who changed planes in the airport and the people who moved there for 30 years and learned the literature and got a job and married the locals. So uh, the, the way to do psychedelics is, uh, I believe, at higher doses than most people are comfortable with and rarely and with great uh, attention to set and setting. Uh, the social use of psychedelics in the club scene or, or at rock and roll concerts and so forth, I mean, when I go to those kind of scenes, I just smoke pot. I don't, uh, because I want to be part of what's going on, I want to have a good time, but I would, you would be nuts to take a major psychedelic in that circumstance. Uh, Socially dense environments filled with light and noise are a strategy for coming down. You know, I mean, if you took a drug you didn't like, the smartest thing to do would be to jog around the block ten times and then chop a, a bunch of wood. Uh, very similar to dancing your ass off, in other words. So uh, the way I recommend doing psychedelics is uh, in silent darkness, and with as little input from other people as possible. I mean, I say alone, if you are experienced, if you're really confident, just alone, for crying out loud. If that gives you pause, and you must have a sitter, and let's use the word sitter, not guide. My God, nobody's guiding you anywhere. They have no more notion where you are than, you know, we know where Judge Carter is at this point. Uh, so the sitter, and my idea of the perfect sitter is, you know, you have a little Tibetan bell by your side, and the sitter is three rooms away, and if you need the sitter, you ring the bell, they stick their head in the room and say, it's cool, lay down, and, you know, do that. And I, you know, as long as this question was brought up and so much of the lecture was somewhat high-toned, let me get into this for a minute. Uh, there are thousands of altered states. You know, we know them. Orgasm, indigestion, 
two cappuccinos, uh, where tequila takes you. So endless altered states. And I'm not really interested in them more or less than any of you are. I mean, they're part of life. But what I'm interested in as an experimentalist, as a, as a connoisseur of nature, you know, somebody who loves fossils, butterflies, rainforests, that kind of thing, is this family of compounds called the indole hallucinogens. Indoles. And they cause hallucination. And some people say, you know, that I'm a fetishist about this, that who cares, or that there are other things besides hallucination. Yes, I know, maybe, and of course, but the reason I'm so fascinated by hallucinations is because, to my mind, when you're hallucinating, you have an absolutely clear proof that you are not generating this material. You know, it's not funny ideas. It's not racing thoughts. It's not insight into what your boyfriend really meant yesterday. That kind of thing we all can generate by just inspecting our own minds. But a hallucination is to be in the presence of that which previously could not be imagined. And if it previously could not be imagined, then there is no grounds for believing that you generated it out of yourself. I mean, we should each know our own inventory, you know? You know what's in your cupboard. You know what's in your chest of drawers. For God's sake, you ought to know what's in your mind. Well, then, if something comes forward and you say, that's not mine, that's not in my inventory, then you have a kind of perfect proof that this is coming from somewhere else. And then the question begins becomes, where? And, and we can set off into that. Opinions differ, uh, and nobody has God's truth on it. it uh, a reductionist, somebody who didn't like these substances, would say, oh, well, it's, it's just neurological chaos. It's just you've interrupted the normal functioning of good brain chemicals, and, and evil brain chemicals are now uh, giving a, a, a sense of, of a chaos. Well, that just doesn't cut the mustard. I mean, that kind of stuff may work if you're talking to the troops, but not if you're talking to anybody who's ever been there. I know what a neurological chaos would look like. It would look like bright lights, moving patterns, colored this, something that. It would not be ruins, landscapes, machines, paintings, works of art, building plans, weapons, bits of, uh, uh, of manufactured technological detritus. These things are too coherent. They're objects in some kind of superstructure of the mind. And for me, this was the revelation. I didn't get into this business by being an airhead or a, or a screwball. My attitude was always, if it's real, it can take the pressure. You know, you don't have to pussyfoot around the real thing. If they're telling you, you know, oh, you must lower your voice and avert your gaze or this and that, then you're probably in the presence of crap. Because the real thing is real. It doesn't demand that you, you adjust your opinion to suit it. It's real. That means it is preeminent. That means it sets the agenda. And I studied yoga. I wandered around in the East. I was fast shuffled by beady-eyed little men in dotis. I know the whole spiritual supermarket and rigmarole. And, and I, I find nothing there to interest me on the level of, you know, five grams of psilocybin mushrooms in silent darkness. I mean, that's where the pedal meets the metal. That's where the rubber meets the road. And the, the inspiration for me to get up and talk to an audience like this simply comes from the fact that I cannot believe that this could be kept under wraps. 
the way it has. I mean, I kidded with you earlier that they would make sex illegal if they could. Well, they can't, so it isn't. But uh, the psychedelic experience is as central to understanding your humanness as having sex, or having a child, or having responsibilities, or, or having hopes and dreams, and yet it is illegal. We are somehow told we are infantilized. We're told, you know, you can wander around within the sanctioned playpen of ordinary consciousness, and we have some intoxicants over here if you want to mess yourself up. We've got some scotch here and some tobacco and red meat and some sugar and a little TV and so forth and so on. Uh, but, but these boundary-dissolving uh, hallucinogens that give you a sense of unity with your fellow man and nature are somehow forbidden. This is an outrage. It's a sign of cultural immaturity and the fact that we tolerate it is a sign that we are uh, living in a society as oppressed as any society in the past. a short question, but I think it's really important. We're not, my thing is not about my opinion or what I saw in Africa or anything like that. This is, get it straight, this is about an experience, not my experience, your experience. It's about an experience which you have, like getting laid or like going to Africa. You must do the experience. Otherwise, it's, it's just whistling past the graveyard. And we're not talking about something like being born again or meeting the flying saucers or something like that where good works and prayer are the method. No, if you take a sufficient dose of an active compound, it will deliver itself to you on the money. If it doesn't work, take more. Nobody is in a position to dismiss this just because it didn't work for them on one or two tries. This is an art. It's an art. It's something you coax into existence. I mean, you have to learn to make love. You have to learn to speak English. Anything worth doing is an art that is acquired. This is part of our birthright, perhaps the most important part of our birthright. These substances will deliver. It is the confoundment of, of psychology and science generally. And that's why it's so touchy for cultural institutions. But you are not a cultural institution. You are a free and independent human being. And these things have your name written on them in big gold letters. Well said, dear Terence. Well said. And as I just mentioned, uh, it's my belief that the next great human revolution will take place at the individual level, one mind at a time. Perhaps uh, we will all have to first revolutionize our own lives, and then, uh, on the foundations of our individual revolutions, will a new global consciousness arise. It isn't necessary for everyone to get it before our species jumps to a higher state of consciousness. As in uh, almost all other aspects of human life, I think uh, only a small number of tippers are required to tip us all into a more human basin of attraction, and it can't come a moment too soon. It seems to me that uh, our beliefs are what ultimately shape our personalities. So who owns those beliefs? If I do, then I'm a free thinker, in charge of my own destiny. But if my beliefs own me, well, then the institutions that formulate and promulgate those beliefs, they own me. Flash of golden darkness in my mind the other day Velvet apple morning, something maddening and gray I keep finding my answers, then they drift away You can't sell me your answers, I feel a different way
inside There is suddenly no lack of nervous misery around What a strange time to be trying to dissolve into white light What an effervescent epilogue to years of paradise Moments. That is all we have, a few good moments. I'll bet you can't think of even one full day that was so great you remember every minute of it. No, uh, at best we remember a few big moments that occurred on a few good days. Thus my quantum theory of memory. Time is measured in moments, and a moment, my friend, isn't very long. So it is now, however, at long last, that I have finally come to grok the fact that the purpose of my life is not to reach a destination, nor is my life a journey. No, uh, for me at least, the purpose of life is to dance. A dance with no beginning and no end, just an endless dance. Here and now, here and now, all else is but memory and fantasy. And now I'd like to close with a poem from the mystical Sufi poet Rumi. It's titled, Where Everything is Music. Don't worry about saving these songs. And if one of our instruments breaks, it doesn't matter. We have fallen into the place where everything is music. The strumming and the flute notes rise into the atmosphere. And even if the whole world's harp should burn up, there will still be hidden instruments playing. So the candle flickers and goes out. We have a piece of flint and a spark. This singing art is sea foam. The graceful movements come from a pearl somewhere on the ocean floor. Poems reach up like spindrift and the edge of driftwood along the beach, wanting. They derive from a slow and powerful root that we can't see. Stop the words now. Open the window in the center of your chest and let the spirits fly in and out. For now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Peace to you, my friends. Ultimately, what we're touching is 
the invisible, all-pervasive intelligence that surrounds us and penetrates us. It is grooming us to be able to tolerate its splendor. It's something like that. It can't just reveal itself because we would be fried. We may never know what hit us. Yeah.